Mike Brown, the former FEMA director. Joining us here is the former FEMA director. History, I think, was very unkind to you, my friend. Very unkind. Mr. Brown, thanks for being with us. This is Michael Brown Unplugged. Hey, hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. And I'm laughing because I, I want you to hear, and I know most of you have probably already, probably already heard this by now, but I don't care whether you've heard it a thousand times or this is the first time you've heard it, this just remains one of the best sound bites I've heard in a long time. On uh, Monday, on MSNBC's The Eleventh Hour, which is hosted by that liar, uh, Brian Williams. You know, sometime I should just do an entire segment on the things that uh, Brian Williams and I did together prior to Katrina, and then the things that he did during Katrina, and then the things he said about me after Katrina. It's a great story, because when I look back on it, he was a lion sack of poop then. I didn't need to wait for a him to go on David Letterman or somebody to lie. But I, anyway, anyway, I digress. So this this former national, uh, actually not national security, this former FBI counterintelligence specialist, he was like an assistant director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. He appeared Monday on NBC's or MSNBC's The 11th Hour, which I take to mean, because I, I don't know, I don't watch The 11th Hour, but maybe The 11th Hour means it comes on at 11 p.m. Eastern Time. So you see, if you lie on the NBC Nightly News with Brian Williams, because you're Brian Williams and you have a parachute in your contract, well, then NBC figures, hey, you know what we can do? We can just keep him on, keep paying him because it's going to be cheaper that way, but we'll put him on MSNBC at 11 o'clock at night. Well, anyway, at 11 o'clock at night, Brian Williams host Frank Figliuzzi. Figliuzzi. I had some Figliuzzi the other night at a, at a pizza joint, and it was, it was okay. It wasn't great, but it was, it was okay. Well, he told Brian Williams that President Trump was inadvertently sending a secret message to the white supremacist movement by ordering U.S. flags flown at half-mast due to the deadly shootings in Dayton and El Paso. But the flags are to be re-raised today, Thursday, August 8th. Now, I'm going to, <clears throat> excuse me, I will not be visible anywhere today because today is 8-8. And if I say or do anything on 8-8, according to Frank Figluzzi, I am apparently a white supremacist Nazi. I, this is just unfreaking believable. Navigate this tomorrow and the next day. This is this starts becoming the definition of terrorism when people develop anxiety about what should be free flowing public places. Exactly right. The definition of terrorism is conduct designed to coerce or intimidate the civilian population. And if we don't take action quickly, then that will continue to, to play out. I have a piece out just tonight in the New York Times on what sadly I think is. Oh, he has a piece out in the New York Times. So he's on with Brian Williams. He has a piece in the New York Times. Your Honor, I rest my case. Nut job to happen next if we don't disrupt the chain of radicalization. What were the warning signs for me, Brian? Ironically, they weren't from my experience in domestic terrorism, but rather they were from my experience in international terrorism and radicalization to Islamic Jihad. Um, you see the same things happening now <clears throat> in white hate uh, groups and white supremacy groups, um, where not only is the internet facilitating the speed of radicalization, but, but our leader, our, our chief executive is seen as almost a mentor. And a Donald Trump is a mentor to white supremacists. I, um, I checked the White House org chart because I was looking for the Office of White Supremacy. I found all of the usual offices. And then I thought, well, maybe it's hidden, you know, in some secret language. So I did a Google Translate of every office into dumbassery, and I still couldn't find it. 
radicalizer. And unfortunately, today, we did not hear what we needed to hear from that person that these extremists and unstable people look to. He spoke in the in the uh, passive voice, in the collective voice. We didn't hear first person from him. We didn't hear, I condemn white hate ideology. We heard the nation must condemn it. Well, the nation does condemn Hmm. Could it be that he didn't speak in the first person because he's the president, not of Donald J. Trump, although I guess we could all claim that we're the president of our own beings, but he's the president of the United States. When the president of the United States speaks, do you know that he speaks on behalf of the entire nation? Yeah. Like when he's sitting down with Putin or Chairman Z or uh, Kim Jong-un or, well, I suppose Melania might be the exception. Uh, when, when he's speaking to any, he, he is speaking on behalf of the United States. We had a president that spoke in I, 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 I. His name was Barack Hussein Obama. And every speech that he gave, there would always be a story somewhere about how many times did Barack Obama refer to himself in this speech. 68 times, 32 times, 112 times, I, 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 I. Because you see, well, Barack Obama was indeed a narcissist, and he really did think that it was all about him. It wasn't about the nation. I actually give Donald Trump credit for speaking about we as the nation, as opposed to I, the president. Let me give you a quick example. I know you can't wait to hear the rest of the soundbite, but just hold on. It's my podcast, so hold on. I remember, and I've told this story a dozen times, so if you've heard it, you can fast forward. I know how these podcasts work. You can fast forward. But I I remember one time being in the Oval Office, and the president, myself, and I think a couple of other people were in the room. I honestly don't remember who the other two were. And there was a knock on the Oval Office door, which is very unusual, because if the president's in a meeting, if it's if it was uh, Ashley, his personal assistant, his secretary, she would just walk in. She didn't have to knock. But somebody knocked. And so the president motioned for somebody, and I forget who it was, walked over and opened the door that's just across from, that faces the Roosevelt Room. And there was somebody from the press office, and they had some what appeared to be junior high. Maybe they weren't quite, and they, they could have been freshmen, you know, like ninth graders, but they certainly weren't like high school seniors. And they were obviously tied to some group that this person thought was important enough that they interrupt the meeting because it was just a meeting with me, right? I mean, so come on in. And so they came on in, and I watched the president talk to this group of, let's just call them middle schoolers. And he, des- he was described, he, he walked around behind the, the Resolute desk. This is in the Oval Office. He walks behind the desk, and he starts talking about the presidency in the third term. And then he starts, des- in, in the third person, I'm sorry, the third term, the third person. And then he starts describing the Resolute desk, again describing it in the third person. Nothing about he sits there or whatever, but, you know, the president, the president is this, blah, blah, blah. And it was fascinating to me because I sat there watching this interchange with these kids, and everything was about the president, not George W. Bush, but about the president. So anyway, back to this whole story about Frank uh, Figluizzi. He's all upset because the president, Donald Trump, referred to we as Americans as opposed to I. And then he continues. But we didn't hear what we needed to hear. So what happens is the extremists interpret what the president read off a script today as something he needed to say, something he he didn't really want to say. So the president's either getting really good advice and rejecting it, or he's getting really bad advice. And, And I'll give you an example of that. We have to understand the adversary and the threat we're dealing with. Here we go. We have to understand the adversary and the threat. If you think, now, maybe many of you need to put on your tinfoil hats. Maybe you need to get inside your Faraday cages. Maybe you need to, uh, or maybe you'll be thinking as you listen to this, that this is not MSNBC. This is InfoWars. This is Alex Jones. This is how crazy. This is bat crap crazy. 
And if we don't understand how they think, we'll never understand how to counter them. So it's the little things and language and messaging that matters. The president said that we will fly our flags at half mast until August 8th. That's 8 8. Now, I'm not going to imply that he did this deliberately, but I am using it as an example of the ignorance of the adversary that's being demonstrated by the White House. The numbers 8 8 are very significant in neo Nazi and white supremacy movement. Why? Because the letter H is the eighth letter of the alphabet. And to them, the numbers 8 8 together stand for Heil Hitler. So we're going to be. And that's where most people stop in this absolute craziness. So if you're out doing anything today, August 8, you're clearly a white supremacist. But because I want you to hear it in context, let me play maybe another 30 seconds of this. Raising the flag back up uh, at dusk on 8-8. No one's thinking about this. No one's, no one's giving him the advice or he's rejecting the advice. So understand your adversary to counter the adversary. I know you Oh, holy cow. Of course Brian Williams doesn't challenge him or anything about about it, but um 88 Heil Hitler. This is this is truly the how ridiculous utterly ridiculous the left has become. Do you think that there's anybody in the White House that even remotely ever thought to themselves Oh, August 8th. Oh, Mr. President, by the way, l- let us let us Google that. 8-8 eight, eight just sounds too, there, there's too much alliteration in 8-8. Eight, eight. So let us Google it and see if the, maybe we should do it on 8-9 or 8-7 or, you know, whatever else. Or let's, let's consult the Office of Numerology and see what they say. <laughs> you got to laugh. It's just one of those... It, you, you have to laugh. I've really been over the past 24 hours back in the kind of funk that I was on Monday after the shootings occurred this past weekend. I've been in kind of that funk, funky mood over the past 12 hours, particularly as I read Twitter and Facebook and other things. I just think, holy crap, it's just it is out of control. It is utterly out of control. And I think to myself, that's what they want me to do. That's what they want all of us to do. They want this, this is this is textbook Alinsky tactics. You need to overwhelm people to the point that they just throw up their hands and give up. Well, I'm kind of at that point every now and then until I remind myself that that is precisely what they want us to do, and I refuse to do so. Yep, I refuse. And so should you. I'll be right back. I think I told everybody that um, the story about the guy on Twitter that wanted me murdered. He wanted everybody like me murdered until uh, apparently the if you if you murder enough people, the country will soon come together. And myself, along with many of you, reported the tweet as a violation of Twitter's rules because it was advocating violence against an individual. And I. I think I told you that Twitter responded about 24 hours later and said, you know, we're, we're, we're very sorry to inform you that um, the tweet does not violate the rules of Twitter. And we know this is not what you expected, but sometimes you'd have to take things in the context in which they were meant. And I thought, well, let me, let me tell you something, sweetheart. I took it in the context that it was meant. He said... I want to murder him and everybody like him, referring to me, until the country can come together. So it was a direct threat of violence against me. But, hey, I I don't care. I was doing – the reason I reported the tweet, not because I feared this guy. He actually lives in Japan. Actually, a good friend of mine uh, who is uh, very active in the Japanese expat uh, community kind of tracked the guy down. I mean, I don't mean physically, but ask around, like, who is this? Who is this dirtbag? And and got some info about him, which I found absolutely hilarious. But I did it not because I wanted or I feared the guy. I did it because I wanted to harass the guy. If you're going to threaten me with violence, then I'm going to report you to Twitter just so you have to deal with Twitter. 
But of course he didn't. And now I understand why. There's a Twitter account by the name of Jack Horsey. I don't know who Jack Horsey is. I don't care. But in a series of tweets, he said this. Absolute scum of the earth, referring to, let me pull this over so I can see it closer, uh, Ben Shapiro and a couple of other people. Absolute scum of the earth, promoting mass murder to stuff his own pockets, referring to Ben Shapiro. Oh, and also in the next tweet referring to Andy No, You know, Andy No, the young Asian gay reporter that was beat up by Antifa in Portland a few weeks ago. So now he drags in Andy No and Ben Shapiro. Because, you know, you want to get both the Asians and the Jews, right? I mean, you can't just go after, you know, one guy. You got to go after, you got to be diversified. So Jack Horsey says in the next tweet, it is no exaggeration, the word no, N-O, not as in Andy No, N-G-O, it is no exaggeration to acknowledge that whoever finally silences at Mr. Andy No and at Ben Shapiro permanently will literally save many future lives. We are all Antifa. And then the tweets continue. Where do you draw the line? Jack Horsey tweets. Do we ban the car brand the shooter drove, the jeans he wore, the cell phone company he used, cell phones, YouTube, where he absorbed Ben Shapiro's poison? Ban the worst guns. I agree 100%. But Cloudflare? Now, Cloudflare is a web hosting service that many people use so that when your web hosting service goes down, Cloudflare steps in as a backup and your website never disappears from the internet. Instead, Jack Horsey says, ban the effing web host for 8chan. And the tweet continued. Where does pure scumbag mass murderer cheerleader Ben Shapiro live in L.A., roughly, neighborhood? It's past time to make his everyday life pure hell, family, CC Mr. Andy No. This is the mob that now exists in our midst. Antifa, progressive leftists, neo-Nazis, white supremacists, all of whom are either far left, or to, in some cases, the extreme right. And I mean the far, far right. They're directly calling for violence against two individuals. And, of course, the account and the tweets are still up. I don't care. Just like I wasn't trying to get the guy that threatened me with murder. I wasn't trying to get him banned. I was just trying to get Twitter to harass him a little bit. But at what point do we recognize that the division, the hyperbole, the irrationality is coming predominantly, in fact, I would say like, you know, 99% of dentists recommend, I would say that 99% of all of this is coming from the left. But you would never know that because the media, who themselves are mouthpieces for the progressive left, never give you an objective point of view. And as long as the fourth estate is giving us an objective point of view, I think there is little hope. I mean this sincerely. I think there's little hope for drawing all of this back. I think at some point they go off the deep end and finally people have to do what they have to do or they flame out. I don't know which. I don't know how, but I think one or the other will happen. I'll be right back. So let's talk about somebody that you probably haven't heard about in a long, long time, Sarah Palin. Let's go back to January 8, 2011. On that day, a dirtbag by the name of Jared Loeffner opened fire at a political rally for Gabby Giffords down in Tucson. He killed six people, injured 13 others. And you may recall that Gabby Giffords was seriously wounded in the attack. Now, just before that attack, Sarah Palin's 
Political Action Committee circulated a map. You know where this is going. You remember this, right? Her Political Action Committee circulated a map that superimposed the image of crosshairs, a crosshair target, over certain Democrat congressional districts. Now, a bunch of dumbasses thought that that was some sort of image of violence. Now, Gabby Gifford's congressional district was one of those districts targeted by Sarah Palin's crosshair map put out by her PAC. The image was publicized during the earlier political controversy surrounding Obamacare, but in the wake of the Loeffner shooting in Tucson, a lot of people, just like they do today, trying to tie the shootings in Dayton and El Paso back to Trump or back to white supremacy or back to whatever they want to tie it to, as opposed to tying it to the dumbasses that did the shooting, they tried to connect the Tucson shooting, to that crosshairs map. Now, there was never any evidence whatsoever to establish that causal link. In fact, I would have been surprised if anybody had been able to prove a causal link. And in fact, the criminal investigation that took place about Jared Loeffner indicated that his animosity toward Congressman Giffords, a Democrat, had started way before Sarah Palin or her PAC published that map with the crosshairs. Anyway, fast forward to six years later on June 14, 2017. Remember that date? That's when James Hodgkinson opened fire in Alexandria, Virginia at a practice for the congressional baseball game. You recall he injured four people, including Republican Congressman Steve Scalise. That same evening, the New York Times, under the editorial board's byline, published an editorial, America's Lethal Politics. And in that editorial, they argued that those two political shootings evidenced the vicious nature of American politics. We're talking about two years ago, and we're talking about events that happened, you know, some as far back as 2011. So in the the Times editorial, reflecting on the Loeffner shooting and the Sarah Palin Pack crosshairs map, the editorial said this, quote, the link between the map and the shooting, the link to political incitement was clear. The link to political incitement was clear. And then the Times noted, that Palin's Political Action Committee had circulated a map of, quote, targeted electoral districts that put Ms. Giffords and 19 other Democrats under stylized crosshairs, obviously suggesting that Congress members themselves had been pictured on the map. Remember, they weren't. The districts were. In the very next paragraph, The Times editorial referenced the Tucson shooting that happened that day, writing this. Although there's no sign of incitement as direct as in the Giffords attack, liberals should, of course, hold themselves to the same standard of decency that they ask of the right. Now, the Times faced a backlash. Within a day, just like they changed the headline about Donald Trump's statements after the shootings, the New York Times changed the editorial issued a correction. They removed the two phrases suggesting that there was a link between Sarah Palin and the Tucson shooter. Added to the editorial was a correction, though, and the correction said this. An earlier version of this editorial incorrectly stated that a link existed between political incitement and the 2011 shooting of Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. In fact, no such link was established. Twelve days after the editorial was published, Sarah Palin sued the Times in federal court for libel. Now, the New York Times moved to dismiss the case. The federal judge had an evidentiary hearing to decide whether or not the allegations of, quote, actual malice, which I don't want to get into, that's not actually the correct term, but whether the allegations of actual malice against the Times were plausible. 
The judge concluded that the allegations were not plausible based on the testimony of the editorial page editor at the Times and the author of the editorial. You see, at the hearing, that editor explained that his reference to Palin in the editorial was intended to make a rhetorical point about the present atmosphere of political anger. And then he recounted the editorial's research and publication process. He answered a bunch of questions in cross-examination about his prior knowledge of the Tucson shooting six years earlier. He was questioned about any connection to Sarah Palin. He testified that he was unaware of any of the other articles published by the Times or by the Atlantic, which had also where he had been the editor-in-chief earlier. Now, I find that laughable. Yeah, I didn't, I, I didn't know about any of these articles. Well, the Court of Appeals said, uh, uh, uh. Among several things, the Court of Appeals said that the district judge's decision relied on credibility determinations not permissible at any stage before the trial. Now, I know this is a lot of legal ease, but the court basically said, you are making judgments on the credibility of witnesses before you even get to the trial. That's the role of the trial, whether that trial is before a judge or before a jury. But when you're doing all the pretrial motions, that's not the place to judge the credibility of the witness. So to make a long story short, the judge said, I don't want to go into all the legalese, the judge said, nope, the case can move forward. Now, this doesn't mean that Palin has proved the knowledge of the editor. It doesn't mean that she has proven actual malice, a misleading term, meaning that the New York Times editor responsible for the article over which she was knowing knew it was false or likely to be false. But it does mean that she can have a chance to prove her case. I think this is monumental. Only because, and I'm sure that at some point, the Times editors or the Time board of directors will tell the lawyers to try to make an offer of some sort of settlement. I hope they don't. I want a trial. I want a trial because, one, I want what these newspapers and media outlets do to be on trial. And then I want a case decision at the trial level so that we can finally get a really, not that this case would necessarily be it, but at least have the opportunity for a really good libel case that may or may not refine or even overturn Times versus Sullivan to get to the U.S. Supreme Court. So watch for news. I mean, It's not going to happen tomorrow. Trust me on this. They've got discovery. They've got all sorts of motions to go through. It's going to be, well, dirt will be even older than it is now before this trial ever takes place, if it ever does take place. But if it does, and of course, I'll bring that information to you. But if it does, we might have a grand opportunity to see the New York Times on trial. Oh, get me some popcorn. Get me a big bag of popcorn. Oh, and some Diet Coke while you're at it, too. Remember all the hullabaloo over the census question about whether or not you are a citizen or not? I never understood why that was so such a radical question. I mean, you, you're not asking anything. You're just, hey, are you a U.S. citizen or you're not, not a U.S. citizen? Wouldn't it be? I, and I think the reason, um, I think one of the reasons why the left was so adamant that that question not be on the census is they don't want to get any really good statistical data, not that this would be any good statistical data, but the the more amorphous the number is about how many illegal aliens live in the United States, the better off we are, or the better off the left is. Because if we actually knew what that number was, 10 million, 15 million, 30 million, whatever the number is, oh, I think people would be outraged. Well, guess what? Even though that question about whether you are in the citizen, in the country legally or not, will no longer be on the census. The Census Bureau is pursuing a legal loophole that it believes is going to allow them to temporarily hire illegal aliens as part of its effort to reach populations that are difficult to count, including non-English-speaking and immigrant communities. 
people employed by the Census Bureau, including those temp- those temps that are hired, are considered federal employees and are supposed to be U.S. citizens. Specifically, the Annual Appropriations Act prohibits the use of appropriated funds to employ non-citizens within the United States by the federal government. Now, there are some exceptions. For example, you can some agencies can hire translators temporarily, as well as hire people admitted to the United States for permanent residence who are actually in the process of seeking citizenship. But otherwise, no, those exceptions are very, very narrow. So the Census Bureau wants to ask a question. Hey, are you here legally or not? Everybody goes apoplectic. But now the Census Bureau is going to use a loophole, or at least they think they're going to be able to use a loophole, to hire non-citizens to count people in this country. (laughs) Uh, Forget the Diet Coke. Can somebody bring me some tequila? Yeah, I, I need some tequila today. Remember yesterday I talked about Julian Castro, the uh, uh, congressman from Texas, who tweeted out the names and businesses of some Trump supporters. Well, I've learned since then that not only did he tweet out and post the names of some of these Trump financial donors, but they were Latino. They were Hispanic. So he specifically targeted Latino or Hispanic donors to the Trump campaign. The other thing that I've learned is that many of those also donated to Castro's campaign. So they're they're a little uh, ambidextrous. They're a little, um, shall we say, they're, they're bi. They're willing to go both ways, apparently. Give a little money to Donald Trump. Give a little money to Castro. They're, they're spreading the wealth around a little bit. But then I learned a third thing on Wednesday afternoon. On Wednesday, Julian Castro was on MSNBC. That's where we go to get all of our dumbassery. And Willie Geist confronted Castro about, what are you doing here? Aren't you targeting and doxing and and putting these people in danger? Now, I'm going to play the little game. You know what? This drives me nuts on Facebook. I, I ignore it all the time. But people always put up these posts, and it'll be a picture, and it'll say, see it? Tell me when you got it, but don't tell anybody else. And the whole idea is to find, you know, the missing link or the missing piece or the difference between photo A and photo B. It drives me nuts. But <laughs> because because I'm just that way, I'm a little, um, uh, just I want to irritate some people. I want you to see, or I want you to hear, and see if you can identify where Castro lets the truth slip out about why he targeted Trump campaign donors. Congressman, it's Willie Geist. It's good to see you this morning. So what is the objective here? What do you hope will happen to the 44 private citizens whose names you posted? Do you want people to boycott their companies, protest outside their homes? What's the goal here? No, that, and that was never my goal. Uh, like I said, my post was actually as a San Antonian. My family has been here since 1922. It was a lament. So it wasn't meant as a boycott. It wasn't meant to, to target these people. Uh, it, it was meant to draw attention to the fact that we've got a lot of people in our community who uh, are respected by San Antonio who... Uh, are contributing to this guy that's using their money to fuel hate. Uh, And so what I hope is that this has started a conversation about what exactly Donald Trump is doing with these people's money. And I hope that these donors in San Antonio and donors throughout the country, unless you support Mm -hmm. the white nationalism and the racism that Donald Trump is paying for and fueling, then I hope that you, as a person of good conscience, will think twice about contributing to his campaign. But, Congressman, as you look at this list, I know you said you didn't put their addresses out there. It's easy to find them. These people undoubtedly are already being harassed online or perhaps uh, face-to-face in some cases. They could be. What do you say to those people this morning who said, I made a campaign donation and now I'm going to be harassed? I'm going to have people protesting outside my business or perhaps even my home. What do you say to them? Do you want them to repent for their support for Donald Trump, or what do you want from them? 
Well, the first thing is that I don't want anybody harassed or targeted. But they will be because or, you put their names on, in public. Look, that, that was not my intention. But that's these what things happen. are. These things are public. No, what I would like for them to do is think twice about supporting a guy who is fueling hate in this country. Got it. Heard it. Recognize it. Let me give you a hint. Young man, young lady, I want you to think twice before you do that again. How many times have you ever heard that from a parent? How many times have you ever heard heard that from a teacher? I want you to think twice. Now, you think twice now. So Willie Guy says, but they will be harassed or targeted because you put their names in public. Castro, that was not my intention. Guys, but that's what's going to happen. Castro, these things are public. Now, what I would like for them to do is to think twice about supporting a guy who is fueling hate in this country. He said that, if you paid attention to the soundbite, he said that twice. Here is a government official saying to people who have freely contributed their hard-earned dollars to the candidate of their choice, I want you to think twice before you do that again. (laughs) Seriously. Um, Who's intimidating? Who is creating the division in the country? This is, this is the um, sophisticated Antifa approach to harassment and intimidation. Julian Castro, bite me. Hey, actually, let me correct that. Joaquin Castro, bite me. Yeah, it was Joaquin, not Julio or Julian or Fidel or Ram, Raul, Joaquin. I'm kind of reluctant to do this story because I might step on Christian Toto's toes, but I can't, I can't resist. In, in, in light of the recent shootings, Universal Studios is evaluating its strategy for advertising a movie called The Hunt. It's a movie about elitists that hunt down and kill deplorables. Yeah, you and me. It's scheduled for release next month. Here's how the Hollywood Reporter describes it. Did anyone see what our rat effer in chief just, you know, a a rat effer? (laughs) I'm sorry, time out. I've never, like mother effer, I've I've heard that, uh, you know, just effing this and effing that. I've never heard rat effing. Did anyone see what our rat effing or rat effer, I'm sorry, I got to get my, uh, (laughs) is it E-R or I-N-G? Let's start this over. The Hollywood Reporter. Did anyone see what our rat effer in chief just did, one character asks, early in the screenplay for The Hunt? A universal picture thriller set to open September 27. Another responds, at least The Hunt's coming up. Nothing better than going out to the manor and slaughtering a dozen deplorables. You know, the the mass shooter, um, I won't mention his name, would have loved this. The script for the hunt features the red state character, red state characters, of course, wearing trucker hats and cowboy shirts, with one bragging about owning seven guns. Wait, you're, you're bragging about seven guns? This shows how out of touch Hollywood is. Yeah, I'm telling you what, I'm Mr. Tough Style. I got, I got seven guns. The script for the hunt features the red state characters wearing trucker hats and cowboy shirts, with one bragging about owning seven guns because it's his constitutional right. Piker, the blue state characters, some equally adept with firearms, explained that they picked their targets because they expressed anti-choice positions or used the N-word on Twitter. Says one character, war is war. After shoving a, shoving a stiletto heel through the ire, through, through the, <laughs> war is war, says one character, after shoving a stiletto heel through the eye of a denim-clad hillbilly. That's a great sentence. That deserves a repeat. Quote, 
War is war, close quote, says one character, after shoving a stiletto heel through the eye of a denim-clad hillbilly. (laughs) At least, I don't know, at least some of the ads for this uh, progressive, um, well, dirt fest, uh, some of the ads have been pulled. The violent R-rated film from producer Jason Blum's Blumhouse, Blumhouse, I don't know, follows, I'll have to ask Christian, follows a dozen MAGA types who wake up in a clearing and realize they're being stalked for sport by elite liberals. Now, Jason Blum also produced Get Out, an appalling movie that was uh, written and directed by black supremacist uh, Jordan Peele which I actually watched part of and couldn't finish it, that encourages the audience to root for a black protagonist as he murders white people. Now, if the Cold War, if the cold Civil War, which some would argue that we're in right now, ever goes hot, Tinseltown is ready. Here's the trailer. I know you can't see it, but you'll get the gist of it. She walks into the convenience store. Hey there. Saunders over to the counter. What state is this? Sorry. You don't understand the question? Oh, no, I do not Just most people know where they are. Why ain't most people? You're in the glorious state of Arkansas, sweetheart. And she kills them both. Grabs some cigarettes, some shotgun you shells. Was lying. Well, this ain't Arkansas, so everyone is lying. Your idea is incredible. I can't argue with that. We pay for everything. So this country belongs to us. It's just business. Hunting human beings for sport. They're not human beings. (laughs) Every year, a bunch of elites kidnap normal folk like us. Where'd they get you from? Wyoming. Mississippi. Orlando. (laughs) And hunt us for sport. Hurry, hurry, hurry up! So it's true. We're being hunted. Hey! What are we gonna wake? What is happening? Put him in the back with the rest. And see us. You just told them we're here. What was that? I think that was a rifle. Ah, uh, you know what? That's enough of that. That's a minute and forty-one seconds of the trailer, and I know you can't see it, but you know how you go from scene to scene to scene. Uh, probably ninety percent of the scenes was somebody getting shot or killed with a crossbow, an axe, or a stiletto in the eye, whatever it might be. You know, for Hollywood to be as anti-gun as it is, they certainly do profit a lot over killing and shooting. Yeah. I don't get it. The Hunt. Uh, Deplorables. Watch out. Hollywood might uh, get some ideas. And the next thing you know, you're going to be hunted. (laughs) So in Germany, they've decided to put a sin tax on meat. You know, if if it's something that's good, if it's something that you and I might like, well, the dumbasses will get it banned. Or they'll tax the hell out of it so that only the ruling class can afford it. For example, let's talk about meat in Germany. German politicians from the Social Democrats, the SPD, and the Greens on Wednesday proposed raising the value-added tax on meat to the standard rate of 19%. Currently, meat is at a reduced rate of 7%, like most food items. Now, the politicians say... I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. The politicians lie and say they will spend the money on animal welfare. Are you willing to pay an additional or just pay 19% tax on the meat you eat for animal welfare? Now, they're not going to spend the money to promote the welfare of cows if people stop eating them. You don't really see many wild cows wandering through the forests of Germany. And by the way, I read a story the other day about old meat. Yes, the new fad in steakhouses is old meat. You know, most meat that we eat in in steakhouses, they're, it, it's, they're like 20 months old or younger. Well, now they're, they're selling cows that are like 8, 10 years old, some older, and it's called old meat. 
Maybe that's what you'll get with the money spent on animal welfare. You'll get more expensive meat. But, of course, we can't talk about meat without recognizing that, obviously, meat also offends the climate. Green Party leader Robert Havoc said that he didn't support the measure because it doesn't go far enough. Instead, he backed a full overhaul of the value-added tax system to tackle environmental concerns. Well, this concern this, this confirms what you and I already know about value-added taxes. Once they're established, progressives are always going to find a reason to raise them. We'll see this for ourselves if Democrats take power and impose Medicare for all or free college or whatever else they want to do. An ever-rising value-added tax will be required to stave off national bankruptcy if the Democrats get control. Scientists have called for bold measures to decrease meat consumption as part of a holistic approach to combating climate change. You know, I'm, I, um, I think we ought to learn how to mitigate against climate change. But I'm, you put the word holistic in front of anything, man, I'm there. Holistic. Oh, it doesn't mean that? Oh, okay, I thought it meant something else. Scientists know that grant money, you and I have talked about this, grant money comes from big government. Anthropogenic global warming is the official religion of big government. But evidence that raising taxes will improve the weather hasn't materialized. I think I'll apply for a grant to prove that. Hang on, I'll be right back. There's a story out of Afghanistan about a suicide car bomb that struck on Wednesday. This would be last week. Killing at, no, I take that back, it's, it's yesterday. I thought it was last week. Killing at least 14 people and injured a further 145 people. Now I want you to stop and think about that. How long have we been in Afghanistan? I talked yesterday briefly about how, you know, the stupid comment about Joe Biden and the fact that we would, you know, not be able to stave off any sort of uh, government takeover or dictatorship or anything else because the government will have F-15s and all we will have are AR-15s. Well, Uncle Joe sent me an email, and I just want to I'm going to plagiarize, I'm not going to plagiarize, I'm going to read the email verbatim. And I want you to think about it in terms of Afghanistan. Biden is being intentionally obtuse when he correctly claims that an AR-15 is no match for an F-15. But he intentionally ignores the other aspects of any armed rebellion by the populace of this country. In the event of an attempted overthrow of our constitutional republic by a tyrant who desired to become a dictator, in this nation, one would have to assume the majority of our military personnel would honor their oaths to defend the Constitution and their general orders, which compel them to follow only all lawful orders, and they would desert before participating in the unlawful use of military force against the citizens of this country. I couldn't agree more with that statement. But that would leave anybody who wants to be a dictator with a small group of sycophant generals and followers, not the entire might of the U.S. military, Joe writes. Second, one would hope that those soldiers who deserted, along with local National Guard reservists, would commandeer stockpiles of equipment, including tanks, stored at local National Guard armories, and join the fight against the tyrant and his band of supporters. I've seen this movie before. Finally, he writes, if you think that tanks and jets can quickly crush a rebellion and hold territory, and this is why the Afghan story made me think about this email. Finally, if you think that tanks and jets can quickly crush a rebellion and hold territory, then why are we still fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan after 10 plus years? Tanks and airplanes can destroy enemy fortifications and clear a path for ground troops, but they cannot hold and control territory. That must be done by ground troops on a building-by-building, block-by-block basis. Good luck with that if a large part of the citizens have guns. Do you honestly think that Maduro in Venezuela or Kim Jong-un in North Korea would still be in power if their citizens had guns? And then he quotes Vladimir Lenin. One man with a gun can control 100 without one. So think about that story at the Taliban. 
still fighting, still blowing people up. We're still there. Is there any end in sight? I don't know. I'll be right back. We'll get to uh, some, I would say, standard taxpayer relief shots in just a moment. But, you know, I've often said that almost anything can be used as a weapon. My Mont Blanc ink pen, my um, little cheap ink pen here that I stole from some doctor's office, uh, almost anything here in my office I could use as a weapon. Decatur, Alabama. All new at four, a picture is worth a thousand words, but this one just says one. Ouch. LaRondrick Macklin is locked up after authorities say he broke into a woman's home, and this is the result. Police say Macklin broke into a woman's home on Wimberley Drive with a firearm. Investigators tell us the woman defended herself by throwing hot grease onto Macklin's face. After being treated for the burns, he was taken to the Morgan County Jail. He's now charged with burglary and domestic violence and is being held on a $300,000 bond. Oh, man, you ought to see his face, too. Ooh, the picture on the television. Hide the children. Don't let them see that. <laughs> yep. Grease. Another weapon. Have you ever stayed at a motel? I'm not talking about a hotel. I'm talking about a motel. You know where you drive up and you park in front of your room? And you go into your room. You're at the Motel 6. They kept the lights on for you. So you get in there and you've uh, you got a nice bottle of Jack or a nice bottle of bourbon or whatever, tequila, and you need some ice. So you get the ice bucket. Well, first of all, make sure you put the plastic in the ice bucket. That's just a pro tip right there. And then you walk down the you walk down the corridor. <laughs> Hopefully you have your concealed weapon with you. And you uh you turn that corner and there's that ice machine. And you open the door and you stick your ice bucket in there and you Get the ice out. Did you ever stop and wonder, like, has anybody else, like, used their hands in the ice? Well, this should make you never want to go to another nightclub, for example, let alone a motel. A man in Florida was so hammered that he thought it might be a good idea to just pee all over the nightclub's ice machine because, well, he needed to go, and, well, there it is. 28-year-old Michael Williams was at 261st, a nightclub in St. Petersburg, when the Popo spotted him urinating inside the ice chest used to distribute ice through the whole nightclub at about 2.30 in the morning. Security guards tried to kick Williams out to the curb, but he allegedly actively resisted, so obviously the Popo was called and quickly arrested, and he was charged with the serial peer uh, with a, a misdemeanor of disorderly conduct. also happens to be that the man was carrying a bag of marijuana with him, which officers found after a pat-down. So in Florida, he was charged with a misdemeanor possession of uh, weed. He was booked into the Pinellas County Jail, released the following day after posting a $400 $400 bond, which isn't that bad, but the damage was done. And now I've done the damage to you. That ice? Think twice. Ooh, that's Joaquin Castro's line. Think twice. Yeah, you got to think twice before you make a campaign contribution. You got to think twice now before you uh, get ice out of the ice machine at the Motel Six, or at your local dive. I- I've never been there, but maybe some of you have been to Zeeland, Michigan, or Zeeland. I'm not sure how you pronounce it. This town was established by Dutch immigrants. It was named after a province in the Netherlands, which, of course, you know the Netherlands or Ho- Holland, whichever you call it is famous for using windmills to pump water out of their subsea-level country back when wind was the modern technology. But guess what? Even in Zeeland, Michigan, wind power fails. Two 125-foot-tall wind turbines owned by the city of Zeeland were initially expected to pay for themselves in about 10 years. But instead, they're being retired and removed because of equipment failure, economic issues, and underperformance. The total project costs Zealanders, if that's what you call them, $600,000. But no worries. It's taxpayer money. It's OPM, other people's money. Both turbines, according to the story, were removed from service in April of 2018 after a portion of the West Wind Turbine's blade was found about 250 feet away in a soccer field. 
Um, I guess there were no soccer players on the field at the time. Good thing it didn't cancel the uh, carbon footprint of any soccer players by, you know, cutting them in half. Now, did they put up the wind turbines because they made sense? Nope, of course not. Zealand was forced to. When they were installed back in 2009, the purpose was to demonstrate wind as an energy source and satisfy Zealand's mandate from the state for its renewable energy portfolio requirement. You think the bureaucrats have learned anything? Do you think they will stop throwing other people's money to four winds? <laughs> of course not. Despite the issues with the two wind turbines and the removal taking place, the Zealand Board of Public Works Utilities Man- Manager Andrew Boatwright said the city of Zealand is still committed to renewable energy and in particular wind energy. Zealand has contractual commitments to the state for both solar and wind to make up 12.5% of its retail load this year. In 2021, the state mandate goes up to 15%. <laughs> you know, here's, here's, I think here, there's a business here, and that is going in and uh, disposing of dead wind turbines. There's always a way to make money, right? Disposable, Michael Brown's wind turbine disposal. Remember yesterday I told you about the convention of the Democrat Socialists of America, Young Americans Against Socialism, posted another tweet. And this is the gift that keeps on giving. I want you to listen to this dumbass that stands up on a point of personal privilege. Privilege once again. Quick point of privilege once again. Hi, James Jackson, Sacramento DSA, he, him. I have already asked people to be mindful of the chatter of their comrades who are sensitive to sensory overload, and that goes double for the heckling and the hissing. It is also triggering to my anxiety. Like, the be comradely doesn't ju- isn't just for, like, you know, let's keep things civil or whatever. It's so that people aren't going to get triggered and so that it doesn't affect their performance as a delegate, okay? Your need to express yourself is important, but your need to express yourself should not trump or over... Your need to express yourself should not trump my anxiety. That's the, that, that is the new world order, the Orwellian world that we now live in. Your desire to exercise your right of free speech, your desire to talk about whatever you want to talk about at the Democrat Socialists of America convention, does not trump the fact that somebody in the room might have a little bit of anxiety. And so you should walk up to the podium and just bow your head and say, I would like to speak, but I'm scared that I might trigger somebody, so I'm not going to say anything. This is pathetic, but this is the new world that we live in. You can't say anything without first clearing it with anybody and everybody within earshot. <laughs> I ain't going to do it. You, you got to clear everything to make sure that you're not going to trigger somebody's anxiety. This is, you know, we talk about it. This is why America's greatest generation hangs its head, scratches their, scratches their temples, and wonders to themselves, what on earth has become of us? Quick point of privilege once again. Quick point of privilege once again. Hi, James Jackson, Sacramento DSA, he, him. I have already asked people to be mindful of the chatter of their comrades who are sensitive to sensory overload, and that goes double for the heckling and the hissing. It is also triggering to my anxiety. Like, the be comradely isn't just for, like, you know, let's keep things civil or whatever. It's so that people aren't going to get triggered and so that it doesn't affect their performance as a delegate, okay? Your need to express yourself is important, but your need to express yourself should not trump or over, like, it... It, it shouldn't, like, trump override or blah, 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 blah. This is the new world that we live in. Get used to it. Let's get a taxpayer relief shot in. Let's go to Shaler Township, courtesy of KDKA. News in Shaler Township. We have just learned that a man involved in a police-involved shooting is now dead. The neighbors told us earlier that they heard several gunshots and then saw a man taken away from the scene in an ambulance. Bob Allen has been at the scene. He talked with investigators a few minutes ago. He joins us live now with more on the story. Bob? 
Stacy, it started as a domestic dispute at a home in the 800 block of Spencer Grove Lane here in Shaler. Now, police say the man's wife reported he was acting erratically and he had weapons. Now, when she uh, called police, they showed up. He barricaded himself inside, ignoring calls for him to surrender and put that weapon down. Finally, he came outside. But police say he was pointing the weapon at officers and he still refused to put that weapon down. There were some previous uh, reports with witnesses that during the course of the afternoon, uh, he was uh, seen, again, I'll say he was behaving er erratically uh, outside the residence prior to the 911 call. Two officers, three officers were involved. Now, two of them were from Shaler. One was from Hampton. Uh, they fired a number of shots, and they, uh, the man died at the hospital. Uh, right now, Allegheny County uh, police are investigating, and their findings in this police-involved shooting will be turned over to the Allegheny County DA. What is it about um, everybody wants to be Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid? You know, you come out, the cops are there, you come out with your gun in the air, you're going to end up DRT, dead right there. Thanks for listening to this episode of Michael Brown Unplugged. You know the drill. You can get the podcast now everywhere. We've, we're now even on uh, radio.com. So anywhere that you can download podcasts, you can get this podcast. And you know the drill about social media. I really do appreciate everybody following me on social media. And the easiest way to do that is to go to the website, michaelbrowntoday.com, michaelbrowntoday.com. All the social media links are across the bottom of the homepage. You click those, you like, you subscribe, whatever it is for that particular social media platform. The other thing I would ask, and I noticed it's a couple of you have done this over the past few days, is if you, if, if you do subscribe through iTunes, if you could leave a five-star rating and then write a quick review about why you like the podcast, that would be great too because that helps us get the podcast distributed on other platforms like radio.com. So thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Take care.